meeting of the Board of Education uh, to order its work session to be read so that Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. preschool programs, we're recommending a 3% increase, uh, and that is based on what we've, um, we've done some research based on what other schools are doing, uh, and that's the average of the increases that we're seeing for 19 so far. And then for the summer programs, um, also based on uh, market information, we're seeing rates, um, uh, we're recommending an increase of 5% on those courses. Through, the, through all of them. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions, and I'm sure Dr. Carabello and um, Ms. Ford can also help answer some of those questions as well. Questions? Ms. Doe? Just real quick. Lord, maybe you know some of your new shows. Um, how do you come up with the 15% of the certified staff and the 25% for the other town employees? I'm going to turn to my colleague and see if anyone else knows. I know I questioned whether it was contractual increase. Uh, I didn't see it in the board policies. I went through that. I didn't see it there. Um, I'm not sure it's a contractual increase. Um, I assume it's something that we... Does anybody else know? <laughs> I know it's not a contractual Okay, right. So it's something that we... Um, and that's been pretty historic for a number of years. Okay. Another question? Ms. Page two, the long chart of summer courses at the secondary level. 
I'm sure there's good reason, but I don't know the reason. For the math and English core courses, they seem to be much more expensive than all the other courses on page two. Is that because of the number of hours, the number of days is longer, or what is the pricing differential there? They're all in the 400s for English and math, the core courses, as opposed to, let's say, we compare it to robotics, or we compare it to um, the college workshop, or a focus on writing. Those are less expensive. Can you tell me the rationale for that? Oh, sorry, Anne. Yes, I can. The rationale is that for the robotics and the courses that are less expensive, those are only for one or two days. The other courses are for the six-week sessions. Thank you. Maybe I can ask a question. Um, how did we arrive at the offerings? They're the, the courses that the Guidance counselors tell us that the students are requesting to take over the summer for both uh, making up credit, improving their grade, or trying to enrich what they're doing so they can take additional courses during the school year. So, um, as we'll be bringing up um, graduation requirements later, that bill and credit recovery uh, we we'll need to be having some more communication with the high school in terms of the offerings that they will want to do even coming uh, this, this summer, looking at different options for them. We do check with the guidance counselors starting in April as to what courses we would need to add for credit recovery because in April they have an idea, so we keep that in the back of our minds so we can make sure that we are able to offer those courses. Other questions? Mr. Chair? Go ahead. I wanted to go back to the uh, tuition uh, cost, and I know I don't want to bring it up now to change it, but I think as we develop the budget for next year that we should benchmark ourselves against surrounding towns and also see how much of an influence uh, the tuition rate is in attracting teachers to the, to the district. You know, we, we say that, but we don't have any data on that and also trying to benchmark ourselves against other, other school districts. Um, I know originally on our agenda we were supposed to be talking about summer school, I guess at this meeting or this month. I guess this is a question for you, Jill. Given that we outlined a series of principles that we were going to target kids with summer school, that were, you know, not performing at a specific level. This seems a little odd to me because what we've done is we essentially have a program that's targeted kids who are invited, quote, at a low performance, no cost, but then you get to high school and that doesn't happen. So that seems to me to be a policy principle disconnect. Um, and I'm wondering when and how that's going to get addressed. Because you guys have to put fees for next year, which is essentially a policy that's not in line with the principles that we've talked about. We have to keep doing, we have to give you the comparison of what was last year before you be able to set any kind of rates that I remember the conversation. I remember watching the video where you talked about this particular you know, issue. So it is a policy. You labeled it as a policy decision. So the board is going to have to determine what your tolerance is for that pricing differential. But you know, I don't understand why if you be giving a reduced rate for free and reduced all the way K five, why you wouldn't expect to you know extend that you know that pricing for middle school and high school doesn't really make sense. Yeah, I guess I'm wondering. But it's an expense, right? So part of it is you've got Lori and all of us who are new, who are you know we're trying to maneuver being new. If we didn't give you the numbers, you know, what would you be comparing against? So we're trying to compare against what is currently. That doesn't mean we're we're not redesigning what can be. For the so future. is your suggestion to do this for next year and then and implement? Then, wow, 
It just seems slow. Well, it's, well, yeah. Well, yeah, it's gonna be. It's gonna take a team, you know, to redesign all of this. Well, so. I, I guess I'm on a different point. I'm on the. This is this is kind of like just a basic right. principle disconnect. It doesn't require redesign because the course is the same, the rest of it's the same. But it's really just a straight financial question, isn't it? Right. There's the financial piece, so that's the part where he's handling. There's the programmatic piece that we haven't tackled yet. So. Maybe if I, I could offer a suggestion, uh, is it possible we could come up with a number for what it would cost to offer those courses to to the students that need this for recovery or to improve academics? Can we come up with an estimate maybe by the public meeting? That's a good suggestion. Yeah. Can I just clarify that I understand the question? So, so you're saying, saying that the class fee, even if you're not free to reduce lunch, would be reduced if you're um, underperforming. That no, what, what, I, what I'm saying is, is that we have this goofy policy. It's a, it's a total incongruous. K through, K through five, we identify a series of students, hundreds of them, who are at a particular level of proficiency, meaning they're not meeting standard. We tell them, hey, come come to uh, come to come to school for free, and then all of a sudden you get to the high school, and we set up a bunch of classes that are targeted at the same kid. But we say, oh, by the way, when you come, you have to pay 450 bucks or 800 bucks, and it's like, yeah, well, it, and what I'm saying is, it, it just it's got a big logic failure in it. So the suggestion was that. They try to figure out what would it cost us to extend the policy to the high school for these courses. Yes. And I'm, I'm at the, I may well be in the minority here, but I, I think last year I had also mentioned, sort of philosophically, I think we, we've come to understand that things like robotics is, is often something that really pulls kids into math or into learning other things. And while you know you can think of it as an elective, it, it is a primary way to learn foundational skills. And so it's not clear to me why we don't have a, a reduced rate for the free and reduced lunch students in that case as well. certain it's not in policy because what we do is it, it's one of these things like you know in, in fees it's not instantiated in policy right? but at least I never found it. Yeah. Yeah. Are there other questions you state? I'd like to follow up on Ms. O'Neill's question. I didn't have the question arriving at the meeting but since you asked and we do have a personnel report as well on our agenda I was wondering if you or Bob Stacy could tell us, do we have exit survey data on teachers' use of our tuition? Uh, do we have some kind of way to survey our staff? Is that already happening so that we have anecdotal evidence that the discounted rate, let's say, may not attract, but it does retain our teachers? So Ms. Sutton's in the room may be able to help us with that. Yeah, I, th I think if that's um, data that you would like, I could easily get it. Um, we've asked in the past, um, but never directly. If you if you want that, I already, I already wrote it down. I could get it this year. I could get it next year. Whatever you like. Maybe you can coordinate with Mr. Stacy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Other questions from the board? All right. With that, we will move on to step one. We'll move on to our action items. Um, uh, the 2018-2019 meeting calendar. Great, so this is something that we have uh, looked at and I believe this draft reflects the most current thinking. If there are other changes though, this can certainly be made. So the idea is we reflected, uh, we got some public comment and feedback that board recognition should start at 6.30 instead of 6. We have adjusted that. 
we got feedback that the board retreat or workshops should probably be held in the evenings and we, we went with the six o'clock. Um, oftentimes we are not going to need four hours and maybe two hours, but we thought we would just do that, you know, make those shifts for um, the last discussion. And then I believe that we uh, reflected uh, moving some of those PDs around. I believe some of that is shifted as well. We kept the one in December though, thinking that might wind up being a financial one. I know uh, that cover page still says board recognitions begin at 6, but the actual, right, the calendar on the second page reflects 630, so the cover page should be healthy. Ms. I'd just like to make a positive comment that I'm so pleased with the change proposed to the kind of content we're covering in the board meetings, the ability to get deep into the issues that really drive student achievement and to not have repetitive discussions, but to have consequential strategic decisions. Other discussion? All right, I'm going to make a motion. Ms. Dayton, second. Ms. Stowe. All those in favor of accepting the uh, calendar? Actually, it's an action item because it was carried over from our public meeting. So all those in favor of uh, accepting our calendar? 7-0. Thank you. All right, moving on. Number four on our agenda discussion item. The first is G004, graduation requirements. Ms. O'Neill. So the first thing is that it's, uh, it's not G004 anymore, but it's 6146. Um, this is the first of the uh, new policies under our key thing, and um, the policy that we have before us is really uh, a collaborative effort of the PGC committee of Mr. Bernstein and Dr. Francis and then Dr. Gilday and Dr. Winters and Mr. Piotrowski, um, all from the very beginning have worked on this for, for several months now, and um, we believe it, it reflects the best of, of Cade and it also it makes sure that we are making uh, our students are uh, we're holding our students to a high standard in addition to being in compliance now with all the state statutes. So if anybody has any questions or any discussion? Is there a red line of this stuff here? <laughs> No, unfortunately, it's, well, not so unfortunate, it's just it's a new process now, so what we've done, since there's really no crosswalk between our policy and that, um, this is a new K policy. So we use their template to go forward. But most of it represents new legislation. Ms. Hmm. Absolutely not for this year not to be decided, not to be discussed. Um, when we do get a chance to work with Wright Tech, I'd love something on dual diplomas, the recognition by Greenwich High School and a technical high school that the student has achieved mastery across a range of disciplines, but certainly not to be incorporated in this round of revisions. I just want to put it in people's minds for the future as we continue to press. Well, you've been very persistent, and I totally, I totally agree, and I, I think it's something that we really should push to make some steps forward. We mention it every year, but we don't do anything about it. So this year, let's make it a resolution that we, we do something to, to move in that direction. And then I hope, uh, you know, if you want to make a motion at the next meeting directing the superintendent to explore that, that may be the way to move this forward. Other discussion? Mr. Chair? So, Ms. O'Neill, I thought maybe we might explain a little bit further how this thing is supposed to work because it's quite different than what we have now. It says here the headmaster shall, through the superintendent, submit to the Board of Education his or her detailed requirements. As I read this policy properly, this essentially transfers from the board to the superintendent the decision on what the standards are. That's the way this, this actually reads. So then, but then it says it shall submit. I guess, is that a notification or is that something that's supposed to be voted on? What is that? How's this supposed to work? 
Let me see if I understand the question. So basically the policy states what the, what the requirements are, the number of credits, uh, talks about biliteracy, the multiple pathways, but the actual uh, standards, the regulations, come from the administration to Jill and then to the board for approval every year. Okay, because I, that, I didn't, I, that, that's not what this says though. But that's, so, what, that's what I was just trying to understand. So what page are you on? I'm on page one. Okay. We're about yeah, it's the last paragraph. It said the House shall submit to the board. It, it didn't, uh, as I read it, and that's why I was trying to be clear, it essentially says, you know, there's some, there's a set, the board has a set of standards, state requirements, <coughs> content areas, and then this vision of the graduate thing is kind of new, which is on page two. It's the second section, communicating graduation requirements. So, and that's okay. Uh, and then it says essentially, I forget exactly where it says it, it says essentially the superintendent shall be deciding what are, what is acceptable graduation um, requirements. It says that somewhere, I forget exactly where it says it. Uh, which is okay. So, but then I guess it said submit, but it didn't say approve. So I presumed it said the board is no longer involved in that part. So how's that supposed to, how's this supposed to work? I'm just trying to understand it mechanically. I believe that the paragraph you're asking about in, I believe that. Is there another one I should be reading? Yeah, I guess we don't approve it. All right, let's try to not have the side conversations with Dr. Miller. All right, so the paragraph you're asking about is in the beginning, and I believe that paragraph simply references the formality of the superintendent affirms that the students have met the requirements, the board affirms that the student has met the requirements. That's the part of the formality of um, certifying that the children are ready for graduation. But when you look at how the policy works, you're actually doing an annual review that's um, described right in the policy. And if you look at the detailed information in so here. Where was, where are you, There's actually a paragraph. I'm, I don't know if it's in the policy language or the re regulation language, but it does have that you will be updating every year. Yeah, I think yeah. I know. It says it somewhere. Someone. Uh, it says, We've looked at this a million times. It does say though that the board we specific we specifically mentioned that at the meeting. Uh, so it's in here somewhere. So what it does do though is it further outlines the timing of the communications for parents, which I think was a need that was identified. And what I'm excited about with this uh, draft is that it gets you to the mastery based proficiency. Yeah, um, that part didn't, that part was great. About that. I, and the, the, it, the, the, it does have all of the requirements that all of you are. I, I guess I'm asking the policy governance committee, committee yeah, on the there policy is. part, which is the only part the board deals with, is, I, I just. I was, so, so, I guess because we're so familiar with it, we, we, we might be reading something in that's not clear there. So, is there, a, 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 how would you reword that? I don't know that I would. I, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is um, if the intent, I, see I read this as the intent is the board doesn't do that anymore. The board doesn't review the standards anymore. That's and I didn't, okay, yeah, that's so true. that's not the intent. But no. I think you need to, somewhere it needs to be revised so that it says, you know, whatever those standards are, they're presented to the board, they're approved by the board. Because right now it just, it reads as just information. It's right. Uh, it's in the third paragraph. Graduation from our public school implies that students have satisfactorily completed the prescribed courses of study for the right. several grade levels. Two, they have satisfactorily passed any examinations and demonstrated district's performance standards and in part by the statewide mastery exams established by the faculty and approved by the board and that they have fulfilled the legally mandated number and distribution of credits. Yeah, so the, the, part, but the, performance, the performance standards now as I read them, are transferred to the superintendent and the headmaster to determine annually what they are. But, but what Jill is saying, I believe, is in the third paragraph, they have to be approved by us. Right, and even in that final paragraph, it 
says the headmaster through the super shall through the superintendent submit to the board the detailed requirements and standards as it um, with the goals of our schools as adopted by the board. So all of that is still your I think process. I think part of my feedback would be I think you need to add a line here somewhere that if they're submitting the standards and they're expecting That's what they're expecting to do. I think somewhere it needs to say the board should take action to approve those standards. Wherever that fits in here. Mm -hmm. If that's the intent, that I think it should intent. probably render that explicit. Um, if you don't think that where it says um, demonstrated by the district performance standards, assessed in part by the statewide mastery examinations established by the faculty and approved by the Board of Education? Established by the faculty and approved by the Board of Education. It says after the mastery examination. The graduation for our public school implies that they have satisfactorily passed any examinations or satisfactorily demonstrated the distance performance standards. Assessed in part by the state. Well, you, can leave, you can leave that part out because mm -hmm. it's a qualifier. Standards established by the faculty and approved by the Board of Education. District performance standards. Okay, so that goes back to my question, which is how is that? So it's the annual approval as part of the regulation. That was what we had discussed throughout the entire committee and it never wavered and it never changed. It was a annual approval. Yeah. So you are going to see this every year. Well, the, uh, I, I think the idea, though, Peter, is the reason we continue to change this annually. We were changing the policy annually. I think the idea is that the performance standards would come as a separate That's fun. recommendation, not something that we're going to redo the policy, but they will come to us for, for approval, right? Mm -hmm. That sounds more reasonable. Okay, so then Does anybody else have any other questions? To, well, just uh, to your point there, if you want something, why don't you just say something like for the avoidance of doubt? So it sounds like we're all sorry. It sounds like we're all agreeing. So why don't we just sort of have a for the avoidance of doubt language somewhere and say exactly what you want to say? Because I think we're all on the same page, don't know. Yeah, I, I, we are. I just tend to let policy governments do the draft. Yeah. Yeah. But no, but there are. Right, we, we could add, we can yeah. add some language to that paragraph. All right. Anybody have a discussion on other points? Uh, I have one other question. All right. So sure. if we were to, these would become the standards. Remind me again, because this is in here, two, starting class of 2023. When would these become the standards? What would we be doing for this year? In the course of study guide, we have the regulation that includes that. Right. So that the regulations are actually in the front part of the course of study guide. I don't know if you saw that. In the course yeah, of but study that one's for next year, right? That's well, I think it year. includes this year. Because the one we got is 1819. Right. We didn't get 1718. We've got 1718 originally. Right, but then that was when it was in policy and standard. I'm just wondering. I I can follow along if it's like we're going to approve this thing and then it's going to show up in the front, which is what I think I just heard. We're going to approve this yes. thing and that's going to show up in the front of the course of study. Yeah. Page six. So, yeah, so district performance standards starting with class of 2018. Yeah, it was on the kids who are graduating this year. That is, isn't that class of 2018? I'm sorry. Where are you reading? In the, it looks like it's page eight. Yeah. Course of study guide, page eight. These are performance standards during class, in the class of 2000. Yeah, but this is in a guide that is it approved yet. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm just trying to follow along here. The course of study guide is, is presented to us. I don't think it's it's approved per se. It, at least not Typically, it's presented and approved. So, and generally, the regulations will also be, I think, with the policies. Yes. Oh. Yeah. So okay. this this is this, this is the regulation that will be with the policy, which.
So in board docs, Peter Bernstein, we will have all policies, no matter what their source of origin, and we will have what we used to call procedures, what I'm now hearing more called regulations. Yes. Right? And they will be online, available to anyone in the district through the board doc system? Correct. We still need to talk to Kim, but I think the idea is to link the two so that we can get from one to the other. So we'll say, oh. From one to the other? Meaning that if you're in the policy, that you'll be able to also open up the regulation, which is the yeah, it's just like there's a parents' choose that names of what we have right now. I'm, I'm sorry, Jill, were you? I was trying to see if I could find this year's course of study guide because it should outline what we're doing this year, right in page six of that document, which is approved, right? Presented. Right, and the, it's a policy change that we approved last spring. I think that's what we determined. Was that whatever? Yeah, but I thought we left everybody hanging. No, we didn't. We left everybody hanging because we didn't have, a, we had for 2017 only, but then we didn't have, we got this one, I get this, this is like, this is what happens 2018 forward. That's right. great. Yeah. The, um, I, I'm sorry, 2000, class of 2019 forward, right? So what the, so the question is, what's says the, is you decide the spring before. So whatever was in place last spring is what impacts this year's kids. Okay, well we made a problem because last year, if you look at it last year, we set one for 2017 only. Right, and then what are... existed was, before that, was what existed. And there were some changes that Rick and Chris were asking for to what existed before that we would implement this year. Right, so the direction that we gave them and what they went forward with was communicated with parents on October 10th. So everybody was communicated with if they weren't hitting the standard. So they had enough information from us in October that that's what they went forward and did. And if you look in the course of study guides that's online, it says credit required for graduation class of 2018. Below that, there's a uh, graduation requirements for the class of 2021 and beyond will be updated after BOE approval. So I think the, the direction we gave Chris and Rick is what they went with, and we gave that direction at the board meeting publicly. Mm -hmm. You don't give so the parents of UIB has been informed. So everybody's got their letter, letters have been sent, they've been returned, everybody met with their guidance counselors. We've got very few numbers of kids that are not um, at the standard. So we are. So yeah, for 18, a student must earn at least 22 credits. It has the distribution requirement. It has perform meets performance standards in reading, writing, math, science, and then you got a letter if you were not on track in one of those performance areas. Mr. Sheriff. And the standards were the standards we set last spring, or that you set last spring. Actually, they got them here. So it's got the course distribution. It's got the standards being they'll read their literacy texts. They will demonstrate confidence by attaining the second level of achievement on CT school day SAT, so the Connecticut school day, three or higher on AP English Comp and Lit, three or higher on AP US History, 42 or higher on Verbal PSAT, 420 or higher depending on what, when the PSAT was taken, 420 or higher on Verbal SAT, one or a goal up, or a goal or above score on the Connecticut Alternative Assessment CT AA for 2018 only. Students who meet at least one of the following criteria are also deemed to have met the standards who demonstrate proficiency at or above 801 on the STAR reading assessment. A student will use standard English to communicate effectively to an audience for a specific purpose, and then it goes on with additional scores in English history 420 on the SAT. Uh, acquiring and demonstrating conceptual, computational, other mathematical skills necessary to formulate, analyze, and solve quantitative problems. It goes out with math scores, 420 or higher on the math SAT1, SAT2, 42 or higher on the math portion of PSAT, or 420 or higher, depending on. So it was basically everything we did last year, I believe. And then for 18 only, students who have met at least one are also deemed to have met the performance standards if they have a 22 or above on the ACT math, which is the college benchmark nationally and who have demonstrated proficiency at 747 on the STAR math assessment. Is that got it? Got it? Oh, okay. 
So that is the class of 2018. I, I, yeah, we're going to try that. I do think in the future it might be nice if we have the regulations available when we're doing a policy to have those as a separate board doc or with the board doc so that we can look at those. I mean, in this case, it was in the course of study guide, but I think it'd be nice to have those. Prevention Council survey. You'll be hearing about that in January. We have a guest speaker coming to present on that. Okay. And then there were, on, uh, I guess on the 18th of January, there's going to be a, uh, a start time and they're going to do an update. But then I saw somewhere in here. There was also another start time update. Can you just help me understand what the start time updates are? Start time update will be after we have all of the data that we need to be able to give you the update. So with the student survey being mid-January, you may get everything but that. So you may have to hear start time updates twice. That was what I was trying to make sense of. It made yeah, more so sense get to just wait until it all... For that. But it's currently... We should have our November survey results back for that January 18th day, but the student survey will just start January 15th, so I don't think we're way around there. So, so Peter, are you suggesting we should wait until she has all the data? That would be cool. Well, I was just trying to understand when they were, because I know there's a lot of chat and discussion out there about it. I was just trying to understand where they were, because I saw the committee one, and then I kind of saw an update. but. Well, I'm sure there's chat because the survey's out, right? Yeah, so I'm sure, sure we can participate in the well, survey. I'll tell you what, we'll take it up in a chair meeting, um, and we can figure out the timing. If but we don't, we don't have one scheduled for regular board meeting, right? It's only scheduled for committees right now. That's what I thought, and I can't seem to find it. I believe January, January 18th of 18, we have a special meeting of the board, school start time, and hot committee. Right. But that's the one I'm seeing. Well, we're, we're going to discuss the ad hoc committees at our January right. or December January. meeting. Right. Yeah, January 4th is correct. Oh, yeah. yeah. January 4th, you've got a 20 minute informational update only mm -hmm. listed. I'm sorry, what was it? It was the 24th, right? Yeah, January 4th. 4th. January 4th. That's what I saw. See, I'm looking too early. Yeah, January 4th is the last one. Okay. Yeah, January 4th. That's what I saw. See, I'm looking too early. So we won't have the student, but we'll have everything else. I wonder if we just defer it until we've got all the data. I mean, awesome. unless there was something really important to come up in that meeting. Okay, thank you. We'll, we'll take that up at the chair meeting. Figure that out, Dr. Francis. Okay. Just as a pondering point, we, I brought this up in PGC, but maybe just to plant the seed in other people's minds. Um, I was suggesting that maybe we also look at our spring schedule and think about if we're able to start doing some pro professional development or if we're thinking about Lighthouse or other things and potentially using some of our meetings for those things as we're looking at agenda planning. If we're feeling warm and fuzzy about that, I think that might be a nice thing to do. I support the Lighthouse Project, and I know it in depth through paid, and I think it's such a valuable program. I'd love to see it in the district. Do they come to us, Jennifer, or do we have to go to them? They will come to us. So can we set the timing, or do they give us the times? Oh, I'm sure they would set the timing with you. Okay. Collaboratively. That's great. Yeah, I think, I think they said I think they said, Joe, when they presented at the end of the retreat, that they look for, it's like a schedule. Mm -hmm. I think they need to meet, I think he said, yeah, like once, or, once a month or once every six weeks, and they need a block of time. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it would be great, I agree with Jennifer, it would be a great thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, it, uh, I think it's something that we should look at. Yeah, I think it would be great to have that on the agenda. Yeah. 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 Yeah
It's an effort. It's certainly something to explore. Anything else on the agenda plan? All right, with that, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. What? No, I know, I know. <laughs> There's two, there are two written reports. If you'd like to sit there and read for a little while, that's just fine. I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Seven zero, she will